Have you come to a point in your life where you question the fundamental integrity of your work? Sam Gilbert did. As an expert in data-driven marketing, the Cambridge Analytica scandal forced him to reappraise a very successful career in a scale-up and go back to university at 39 to rethink the role of data in our future. We talked to him about his book, Good Data, an optimist guide to our digital future. Welcome to The Evolving Leader. Scott Allender here, along with my friend, and honestly, one of the most positively influential voices in my life, Mr. John Gomes. Thank you, Scott. That's really kind of you. And and I have to say, you're one of the most consistently contrarian voices in my life. So we make a good team. (laughs) (laughs) Only joking, of course. How are you feeling, Scott? Well, I was feeling pretty good. Um, (laughs) Yeah, well, actually, don't blame you. I I probably am a bit of a negative influence. I remember when we used to actually do leadership development programs in person, and I would keep you out past your bedtime more than once. So I'll I'll own it. I'll own it. How are you feeling today, John? I'm feeling great. Um, I am eager to talk to our guest today. So would you like to introduce him to our audience, Scott? Yeah, sure, sure. So today we are joined by Sam Gilbert. Sam is an affiliated researcher at the Bennett Institute for Public Policy at the University of Cambridge. He's an expert in data-driven marketing, and he was employee number one and chief marketing officer at Bot by Mini, an award-winning fintech startup named as one of Wired's hottest startups in Europe and ranked in the Sunday Times Tech Track 100 list of the UK's fastest growing companies. And previously, he was head of strategy and development at the data company Experian and head of consumer finance at Centender. He's also author of Good Data, an optimist guide to our digital future. Sam, welcome to The Evolving Leader. Well, thanks so much for having me, Scott, and thanks very much for that very kind introduction. Well, let's start with a background of your career, as we tend to do with our guests. And I'm particularly interested why at 39, you decided to leave what looked like a dream job and go back to university. Sure. So, as you mentioned in the introduction there, I'm a researcher now, but actually spent the vast majority of my career in the commercial world. So, uh, initially in online banking at HBOS, and then at uh, Santander, uh, both in the online banking team and then latterly running the consumer lending business in the UK around the time of the 2008 financial crisis, which was pretty interesting. Um, After that, I joined Experian to set up the UK arm of a financial price comparison website that Experian had acquired in the US. And actually probably worth pausing at that point to say that it was while I was at Experian that I did a leadership program called Inspire that kind of profoundly changed how I thought about leadership and how I thought about meaning in the context of my own career. And that experience is kind of still very much with me. And it was very important in the next move that I made, which was to leave Experian and join what was then a two-person startup called Bought by Many as Chief Marketing Officer. And in the course of the following six years, um, Stephen Mandel, Guy Farley and I grew that business from being three guys in an office that was literally turned into a stationary cupboard after we left it to a business that's now valued at $2 billion, uh, insures more than half a million pets in the UK, Sweden and the US, and has, I guess, been one of the major success stories of the fintech category in the UK. So I guess from a from a sort of one perspective it looks like a pretty weird decision having been working in that role at such a successful business to uh, to quit it and to leave it behind and to go back into academia and back into education but I guess what I was feeling in around uh, 2018 was that a lot of the things I had been involved in during my career were being implicated or seem to be implicated in some of the major crises of the moment. So particularly things like the Cambridge Analytica scandal made it seem like digital marketing and the data economy had been instrumental in political outcomes that a lot of people were concerned by, not least 
Brexit, and not least the election of Donald Trump in the United States and other populist type leaders in other places around the world. And what I think I realized in 2018 was two things. So one was that I personally needed to do a different kind of leadership from the type of leadership I had been doing up until that point. And the second thing was that I felt like I had something important to contribute to that political discussion that had suddenly started happening about digital technology and data. But I didn't have the right understanding of the political context or the right language for talking about those issues. So that was kind of behind my decision to leave Book by Many behind and and go back and study politics at Cambridge. So your book starts with the terrifying scenario that the book's surveillance capitalism termed um, by the the Harvard professor Shoshana Zuboff. Organizations like Facebook are diminishing human freedom, stealing our personal data, using it to manipulate you into becoming addicted to its apps so it can harvest more data from you, which it sells on to advertisers. And I guess what you're saying is you, you were worried that you'd lost touch with reality because you were part of that whole system. Yeah, that's, that's exactly right. So obviously there was a, an awful lot of coverage in the media, and particularly Channel 4 News and then The Guardian and The Observer about the Cambridge Analytica scandal and the fact that all these illegitimate tactics appeared to have been used as part of the Brexit campaign and part of the Trump campaign. And so I think for a lot of people who work in data and digital marketing, that was a very unsettling time. And I went to this uh, Guardian live event in the Barbican Centre in London with my friend and colleague, Jim, who I had worked with at Experian for a number of years. And at this event, Christopher Wiley, who is the whistleblower from Cambridge Analytica, and Carol Cadwallader, who is the investigative journalist who had broken the scandal, were in conversation. And so they started the event with... Christopher Wiley describing all of the nefarious ways in which individuals' data had been used to manipulate them in the context of these two elections. And as he was explaining this, I think Jim and I were both feeling a little bit like um, David Mitchell in that now very famous sketch from that Mitchell and Webb look where uh, he's he's a soldier in a fascist army on the eve of battle. And he notices that he's got a skull and crossbones on his cap and has this awful moment of realization. And so he turns to Robert Webb and says, are we the baddies? And so I I kind of had a bit of an experience like that of of thinking, you know, I, I think I'm a person with integrity and I have a like strong conviction that it's important to try and contribute to the world in the best way possible through one's work. Have I been getting this all wrong all this time? And I think Jim was feeling the same. Um, But actually, as Christopher Wiley continued to talk about what Cambridge Analytica had done, I realised that actually what he was saying was not right. So he was saying some very misleading things about the way that data can be used in marketing. And he was also saying things that were just plain wrong so you know i know from personal experience that it's not really possible to psychologically manipulate people with marketing or advertising just because you happen to know or you happen to have some sense of what their personality type is according to the you know the famous big five model of personality but that was kind of what he was suggesting and he was also saying things like that the Cambridge Analytica had individually targeted people with individually customized messages that they delivered through Facebook ads. And I knew from having run a lot of Facebook advertising myself and from acquiring a company that specialized in Facebook advertising when I was experienced that that's also not possible. Like the minimum number of people you can have in an audience when you run a Facebook campaign is 100 people. So it doesn't make any sense at all to suggest that people can be individually targeted. And so I, I guess having, having been to the, into a bit of a trough for a moment, I realized that actually it, it wasn't that I'd been completely misled 
about data and digital technology through the course of my career, really the problem was that a lot of claims that were being made about what these techniques and technologies do were incorrect and they were being repeated in quite an uncritical way, both in the media, but also in also by academics. And that if those claims weren't challenged a little bit and a more nuanced picture of what was really going on wasn't presenting, there might actually be some really detrimental costs for society. Before we move on to the positive side of things, can we, because you're, you're saying it's nuanced, but there is quite a lot of things to be concerned about. Yeah, I mean, so, so I guess one of the good things that has come out of a lot of these issues being much more in the public eye has been a much better general understanding of the role that is played by data in the business models of big tech companies. So as we live our lives online, we essentially just constantly are producing data all the time. So we do that when we update our profiles on social networks. We do that when we click on adverts or when we put things in our shopping basket on websites and when we Google things. And and because we now have the internet of things and the internet has sort of spread out of the purely digital realm or into the physical world, all kinds of data also get produced by us, us going about our normal lives. So if we, if we talk to a voice assistant that produces biometric data, if we have a Fitbit or some kind of device that we use to track our health, that produces biometric data as well. So I, I guess digital technology is very, very pervasive and it's just in the nature of digital technology to produce data in this way. And so, of course, what then happens with that data is that it's monetized in various ways by corporations. So the obvious ones being the targeting of digital advertising happens based on all of that data that is produced by us living our digital lives. And similarly, a lot of big tech companies will use that data to recommend products and services and entertainment to us that they think that we ought to engage with. And those kinds of data-driven activities are a very important part of the business models of Facebook and of Google and of Twitter and of many other big technology companies. And so I, I guess what's at the, the heart of the concern about this amongst commentators and academics and also just ordinary people is the idea that there's sort of something inherently wrong about that collection of data and the use of data in that way. So I think some people feel like it's wrong because it's a, an invasion of privacy that is kind of equivalent to if somebody listened to your private phone calls or if they installed a surveillance camera in your home and watched you without you knowing i think other people think that it's wrong because the financial success of these companies suggests that the data that we all produce as we live our digital lives is enormously economically valuable and therefore we're kind of being cheated or or, or something's being extracted or expropriated from us and so there's a sort of economic injustice happening i guess i probably take a, a slightly different view to that which we can get into but I, you know I, just to be clear like I, I do welcome the fact that people like Shoshana Zuboff with the age of surveillance capitalism and Carol Cadwallader with her investigative reporting have just made everybody much more aware that this is how the world works for better or for worse. So you mentioned the ethics of it which I'd love to get into a little bit more but maybe first um you, know, you talk about surveillance capitalism and Cambridge Analytica, and it's sort of hard to see how, you know, the power of data could be channeled for good. Um, but can you tell us about maybe the optimistic side of this a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and like it's maybe worth underlining that a big concern for me is the extent to which we collectively have lost sight of the 
optimistic side of digital technology and data science. So we're in this moment of profound uh, pessimism, really, about it. But um, just to come on to some of the things that I think are specifically positive, I mean, I actually, um, surprisingly to many people, I think that data-driven targeting of advertising is a socially useful thing. I don't think it's there's anything inherently morally problematic about it. And you know, some some of the ways in which I think it's beneficial. Um, in the b- before we had targeted digital advertising, it was much more difficult for small businesses and local businesses to advertise to find prospective customers. So unlike large corporations, marketing channels like direct mail or TV advertising or press advertising or radio advertising are simply not accessible unless you've got a multi-million dollar marketing budget. One of the big benefits to the economy of Facebook and Google making these tools so widely available is that many more advertisers are able to use them and it's quite interesting to me that on like Google has 4 million advertisers, Facebook has 7 million advertisers. So that kind of gives some sense of the way in which they have lowered the barrier to entry to businesses to be able to promote their products and services. And I guess from my own experience with Bought by Many and the experience of many other startups that have come out of Silicon Roundabout in London during the last 10 years, I think all entrepreneurs who have got business to consumer startups would have found it almost impossible to make their businesses successful without Facebook ads and without Google ads. So where there are these new disruptive products and services that people like, you know, so in addition to bought by many, there's businesses like Uh, TransferWise or Monzo or Starling in the financial services category alone, like a lot of these businesses have only been able to grow because they've had access to Google ads and to Facebook ads. And even in the context of political campaigning, where I think majority opinion at the moment is that it's, it's, it's unethical and it's just shouldn't be allowed that political parties should be able to target campaign messages using data. I actually think it's very useful in that context as well. We've had a lot of focus on how uh, populist candidates have made use of these tools in unsavory ways, but it's worth bearing in mind that the same techniques are valuable if you're running a straightforward political campaign and you simply want to tell different types of people about the parts of your policy program that most matter to them. So, for example, you might want to speak to commuters about your plans to upgrade transport infrastructure. You might want to speak to young families about your plans to improve education. Data-driven targeting is the thing that enables that to happen. Uh, It it doesn't need to be a thing that creates filter bubbles and uh, damages democracy. And I guess my Evidence for that is that long before we had Facebook targeting and, and Google targeting, we had this technique called geodemographics that was developed in the 1980s to help um, sell, well, to help sell products through catalogs. And effectively, what the way that geodemographics worked was that it made probabilistic judgments about what sort of products people would be interested in based on the places that they lived. So if you lived in a suburban, a large suburban house, a long way from public transport, then you're much more likely to be a good prospect for child car seats than somebody who lives in an inner city neighbourhood where all the properties have been converted into small flats. So so that geodemographic technique that's used to kind of match things that might be interesting to people, to the people who might be interested in them, it doesn't require anything particularly sinister for it to work. And it's actually just just pretty useful in all these different contexts, I think. Um, and maybe, maybe kind of just like one final thing to say about why data-driven targeting is useful is that 
I, I believe it actually gives us a better experience of the internet and that if we continue down the current path, which is like very much against targeting, we may end up with an internet where all of the advertising inventory is filled by the lowest common denominator. So hookup apps or gambling websites. We, we may not like the internet that we get if we go too much further down this path. And so, so look, this was some stuff about why data-driven targeting is useful. I, I think there's a, another side to it, which people probably find a bit easier to agree with than that. And that is some of the other benefits that you get if you put more data into the public domain rather than less data. So the thing that I'm particularly passionate about is internet search data. This is partly because by analyzing a very large volume of internet search data at the beginning of the journey with Bought by Many, I found the, the golden opportunity that ended up defining the direction that Bought by Many took. So we started the company and the thing we were trying to do was redress imbalances of power in the insurance industry and help people who had unusual needs for insurance to get a better deal from insurance companies. So I wanted to look at the data to find out what the best opportunity to do that was. And it turned out that the very best opportunity was pug insurance, as in insurance for pug dogs, which was, which was kind of surprising. Uh, but it turned out that there were really good reasons why people were searching for pug insurance. And that was that at the time, if you wanted to buy a responsibly bred pug puppy, it would have cost you £5,000. But insurance policies only paid out a maximum of £1,500 if your pug was lost or stolen at that point. Um, if you have a pug, you know that there's particular health conditions that pugs are predisposed to, like hip dysplasia, problems with their eyes, problems with breathing. The standard practice at the time was for pet insurance companies to exclude those breed-specific conditions from, uh, from the, the cover. So what that meant was if you were a pug owner buying standard pet insurance right then, it didn't cover the risks that you needed it to cover. So we ended up building this very successful pet insurance business based on this insight from analyzing anonymized search data that told us where the market wasn't doing what it needed to. And then if, still with search data, we move away from the commercial domain and then into uh, the nonprofit um, type domain. There's been some really exciting work in the last 12 months using symptom searches for COVID-19 symptoms. So a guy called Bill Lampos at University College London and his team built a computer model that can predict COVID outbreaks 17 days in advance of the official statistics by looking at the Google searches that people make for COVID symptoms. A marketer called Patrick Berlinkett in New York applied a similar methodology, looked at searches for a particular COVID symptom, the loss of smell in Tanzania, and was able to show based on searches for the loss of smell in Tanzania, and this was back in, in May 2020, that the claims the Tanzanian government was making about having defeated COVID didn't look at all credible because thousands of people were still searching for, for loss of smell. So that just gives a little bit of a sense of the types of public health benefits that can be realised if people are happy to let their Google searches be aggregated and anonymised and then made available either to businesses to develop products or to uh, researchers and public health workers to um, build useful models like the ones that Bill Lampos and Patrick Berlinkett built. So we had um, the founder of Wired magazine on our show. We interviewed him earlier this week, uh, Kevin Kelly, and uh, you know he's a, a tech evangelist and optimist, um, and he continues to see um, a huge explosion uh, of uh, of the economy as a result of tech-driven innovation. 
and new business models. And, you know, he's clear-sighted about the fact that the huge benefits will be matched with huge new emerging challenges because technology does that, doesn't it? It just brings out new new problems to solve. Um, and I think w- w- what I'm interested to hear from you is, A, w- what you think some of those kind of ethical problems are that leaders need to face. And also the fact that each generation that's growing up frames them differently. They, they accept risk. They accept transparency. They accept the, the, the kind of what technology wants differently. So we have a kind of multi-generational set of ethical, social challenges that come around um, having more, more data in the world. And I guess that the, the other part of this question, apart from the, the ethical challenges that leaders need to face, is the complexity of this is just the implications of your data being out in the world is is so big it's beyond most of us to understand it so when you know you you talk about well, I'm, what I'm searching for what I'm buying where I'm going all of that builds a profile of me over the course of my life that will reveal more than anybody else in my life knows about me you know <laughs> my health my my habits my wants my desires all of that will be you know, built up potentially uh, across one or two platforms that that I might not even understand uh, the implications of that at some point in my life. So there's going to be a whole bunch of unforeseen consequences. I'm just interested to know what you think about that. So I guess one of the things that this raises, uh, exactly as you said, there's a lot of, we're in a kind of period of flux. A lot of things are changing. A lot of things are uncertain. And I think like one, one thing that's very clear from that is that this sort of neoliberal idea that the duty of business is to maximize shareholder value as far as possible within the constraints of the law, like that, that is over. I mean, if, if that was ever a good idea, it's not a good idea anymore. And actually, in fact, there's been some interesting work by researchers at Oxford University looking at the way in which even apparently sort of hard-nosed investors do make moral judgments about companies. So if you look at what happened to BP's share price after the Deepwater Horizon oil spill or to um, Union Carbide's share price after Bhopal, you can infer from the share price performance that even the investors thought that there had been an ethical failure that was over and above any failure that could be quantified in terms of the financial results of the company. So I think, you know, it's, it, it's a welcome thing that we can, we can put that to bed. I mean, though I should also say that like in practice through, throughout my career, which has been in, it's been in banking it's been in data and it's been in technology. Basically, more or less everybody I've ever worked with has believed that their work ought to mean something more than creating shareholder value. And they've had a sort of conviction that they want to make the world better in some way through the work that they're doing. So I guess I'm inclined towards the view that even people who work for for for-profit companies are not just sort of profit-maximizing robots. Um, But but I guess the thing that's probably become more complicated is that in the past, it was easier for people to rely on laws and regulations and settled norms about what ought to happen and because so much is changing now, sometimes there are areas where we just don't have the right laws and regulations yet. And we can probably include the use of biometric data in criminal investigations in that category of things where the laws and the regulations are lagging behind the technical reality. Um, and, and I guess maybe to give a sort of another example there, I quite often find myself thinking about why it is that we didn't have really controversial and upsetting examples of people using geodemographic targeting through direct marketing in the 1980s and 1990s when 
those are the same techniques that now seem to be implicated in all of these problematic outcomes that we touched on earlier. And I, I think probably the reason for that is that there was a, a set of norms and a set of mutual expectations that applied at the time. So if you, in the 1990s, if you wanted to run a direct marketing campaign and put across a very emotive or controversial message, I don't know, let's say you wanted to promote a miracle cure to some illness or, or disability. If you had wanted to run that campaign, you would have had to have a mailing house to work with. You'd have had to have a direct marketing agency to do the segmentation. You'd have had to have probably a creative agency to produce the physical collateral you were going to deliver. There would have been multiple parties that would have had to be okay with you sending this particular bit of marketing to this particular audience. Um, in addition to that, you have organizations like the Direct Marketing Association that set rules and standards. So even if you had been not particularly moral and you had been willing to put your pursuit of your commercial interests completely above what was right, it would have been really difficult to do that because everybody else's moral compass would have acted as a check on that. One of the things that's different now, if you want to run a Facebook campaign or a Google campaign, is that all of those functions have been collapsed into one piece of software. And so if I decide I want to promote my miracle cure, nobody's gonna stop me. All I gotta do is log on to Facebook or Google, put in my credit card number to pay for the ads, choose my audience and I'm good to go. You know, may, maybe, maybe an algorithm will flag it if I say something that is on a list of keywords that's not acceptable, but most of the time I can I can pretty much say what I like. So, so what, what that kind of points me towards is two things. So one is a need for the big technology companies, not necessarily to change the ways in which they use data, but I think they need to change the ways in which they give permission so indiscriminately to people to use these very powerful targeting tools. I think they need to take more seriously their responsibilities in that regard. So, you know, like one example from politics again is that the alternative for Deutschland, which is the right-wing populist party in Germany, which has some very unsavory views, has been able to use Facebook targeting tools to amass a Facebook following that is much bigger than any of the major uh, political parties in Germany, and that seems that seems quite problematic to me. I don't, and I don't think it's a problem with the the gathering of the data or the the targeting techniques. I think it's a problem with who is allowed to do those things and what controls exist around their ability to use it. So that's that's one thing I think needs to happen. There's tech companies need to be more strict about who gets to use these tools. And then I think the, the second thing, and this sort of speaks exactly to your point, John, is that at, at these times of flux and change, it is more important for leaders, for marketers, for everybody who works in a commercial organization that uses technology and data to cultivate and take seriously their own moral sensibility I suppose, because there aren't the same things to rely on for guidance about what is right and wrong than there used to be. And maybe a thing that needs to be added to that is a strong sense of the potential unintended consequences. So I think if, if we were to rewind 10 years, maybe we would think that uh, having everybody in the world more or less able to access encrypted group messaging via a, a device. Maybe that would have seemed like a utopian thing. It would have seemed like a wonderful privilege. I think now, now that we know that one of the ways that can play out is that a genocide against the Rohingya people in Myanmar can be organized using that technology, we ought to think much more carefully about the potential unintended consequences of tools and techniques and technologies and data sets that we make available. So I think that's part of the ethical thinking that's, that's required is not just 
what can we see today but like how might this be used to facilitate bad things happening in the future and that probably implies a more cautious approach than has typically been taken in recent years. We want to hear from you. Send us your leadership questions on Instagram at Evolving Leader and John and Scott will address them in a future show. And be sure you're subscribed to the Evolving Leader podcast on your favorite platforms so you catch all of our exciting new content. Thank you for listening. Now, let's get back to the show. So with the leadership piece, what other what are some other implications for leaders? What what do they need to understand about data today that they may not and for the future? I'd love to hear some of your predictions about you know what this is all going to look like 5, 10 years from now. Yeah. So I think that it sort of reminds me a little bit of how a lot of the Experian leadership used to talk about data. So, so Experian is in the data business. Mm-hmm. And so a phrase that was very commonly used was this phrase data assets. And so it, like implicit in the idea of assets was the notion that data was this sort of precious, scarce resource that Experian as the business controls and its objective was to generate value from uh, renting those data assets or, or monetizing them in some other way. Um, and I guess that, that is not a way of thinking about data that I any longer think is correct. And that's, that's partly for sort of philosophical reasons. So in economics, people will sometimes talk about non-rival goods and what they mean by a non-rival good is one where the value of something is not diminished by many people being able to use it. And, and this is what data is, right? It's, it's non-rival in nature. It can be copies and reused and reused and reused infinitely. It will never get used up. The value of the copy will not be any less than the value of the original. So there's actually something I think philosophically wrong in thinking about data as a, a scarce resource. And, and I think when you sort of make that philosophical leap, the whole idea of thinking of data as private property, of, as anybody's private property, doesn't make so much sense. And I think you follow that thought to its conclusion, what it implies is that we might be in a better position if we collectively think about data as a shared resource or as a commons. So we we talked a bit earlier on about the fact that all of us are effortlessly proliferating more and more data every day. Perhaps the best way to think about this is that the enormous reservoir of data that is created is like a public, it should be a public pool that, that everybody's contributing to it. Everybody should be able to draw on it. So that's, that's one sort of mindset change that I would really like or leaders in all types of organizations to consider. So then maybe a more specific thing that again re- relates to this tendency to think of data as an asset or as a scarce resource. Um, I think that also means organizations that think they have valuable data don't concern themselves uh, so much with the potential of other data that is out there unless it's data that they can assert some sort of ownership rights over. So what that means, I think, is that organizations are yet to really realize the benefits of movements like open data. So this is where um, data, particularly from governments, gets put into the public domain in order that all different types of organization can make use of it. And there's, there's been some really inspiring examples of uses of open data. So probably the most famous one is the app City Mapper, which I'm sure many people will be familiar with. It's probably the best public transport um, journey planning app, not least because it works the same whichever city in the world you go to. Um, and it's, it's a massive upgrade on 
the individual apps made by individual local and national governments for getting around cities. City Mapper is only possible because governments chose to make reliable feeds of public transport data openly available for third parties to innovate on top of. And so then entrepreneurs at places like City Mapper are then able to bring their own capabilities as developers, their own um, inspiration for what products can be created and much better things get built as a result. Another sort of similar example I really like is from Buenos Aires, where there's an app called Properati. And they've taken open data about from the tree census in Argentina and used it to produce a hay fever app. So if you are somebody who suffers from hay fever, you can plan your commute to work or your trip to a restaurant based on where the pollen producing trees are and aren't. That's the kind of thing that, you know, with the best will in the world, nobody in a local government or a central government would have thought to build or, or had the capability to build. So those are some of the benefits that come from open data. And I just think that many more organisations would benefit if they understood that those data sets are there and started and they started applying their own creativity to what might be done with them. Then I suppose the, the flip side of that is that it would be great if leaders at all different types of companies consider the public benefits they might create if they were to open more of their data. And so just one example of that, I had a great conversation that I describe in the book with the head of strategy at one of the major banks in the UK. And they have discovered by analysing their own transactional data for people's card payments that it's possible to predict episodes of problem gambling and manic episodes amongst people who have bipolar disorder from analysing transaction data from their cards. And in fact, those, those patterns are even apparent many years in advance so the data kind of contains clues that probably even the people themselves are not aware of. So it, it's probably going to be really clumsy if a bank tries to do something with that data themselves. And there's, there's probably no way that that's going to go well. But what those banks could consider doing is making that data available via API in order that a charity like GamCare or a charity like Minds that are focused on gambling addiction and mental health could develop apps that could use that data to help people manage their conditions. And again, it's one of those circumstances where it is impossible to imagine all of the useful things that might come out of more organisations choosing to make data openly available. So that, that, that is a thing that we'd really like more leaders to take seriously these these fast scale um unicorns um have employed a whole bunch of new techniques to grow their markets and and there's a whole ecosystem of tools that allow them to do it and this whole growth hacking area that's built up around that is very alluring um as a as a discipline um and you know a lot of my clients are intrigued and are using these tools um but the, it also feels like there, there's a borderline kind of gray zone here because it feels like a, a little bit of a, a kind of warfare approach because you've got data scraping, which is sounds a bit questionable in some cases that you're, you're taking data when people don't know um, that you're taking it uh, from, from people who have legitimately collected it. And you're also using tools to kind of defeat the defenses that individuals and organizations are putting up to stop you from getting hold of their email addresses or, you know, being able to access their Instagram accounts and so on. So how do you, you know, how do you see marketing, the role of marketing change as, as that kind of um, uh, activity becomes more prevalent in the mix? Yes. So I guess there's a lot of things going on underneath that, that trend. And I'm not a big fan of the phrase growth hacking, um, actually exactly for some of the reasons you've just alluded to, which is that it does, like using that phrase seems to suggest that it is legitimate to do hacker type activities in the course of 
building a marketing campaign, which doesn't seem right to me at all. So, so but, the, it, but the flip side of that is that it's one of the most highly sought after roles in what you would regard as quite blue chip organizations at the moment. It's a really scarce talent that people are, are hunting for. So even if it has got an ethical kind of concern around it, it doesn't seem to be worrying people. Yeah, well, I, so, so I think maybe the less emotive way of describing it is growth marketing. And it, it, it means broadly the same thing, but it's not got that, that unsavory edge to it, I guess. <laughs> Um, I, I, you know, and just like for what it's worth, I also, when I see large organizations advertising for growth hackers or saying they've got a kind of chief growth hacking officer, it does feel a bit sort of, a bit like they're trying to, they're playing catch up with the cool kids and they're five or six years behind um, when... That's what the, we middle-aged people do, I'm afraid, <laughs> Sam. You know, come on, we just, that's what we have to do. We have to get down with the kids. <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe that's what it is. Um, yeah, so, 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 so anyway, so, so I think, like, one can probably best understand this in the context of a couple of trends. So one is the growth of digital channels, the, the, the pervasiveness of digital technology, the fact that when you run marketing campaigns through digital channels, it's possible to measure things and optimize them in ways that were just, it, it just couldn't be done before. And because you can measure and optimize, that has made marketing into a much more quantitative discipline in all different types of organization. So alas, gone are the days of marketers being the people who got to have the boozy agency lunches and write a few creative ideas on post-it notes and then and I go, go to an event in the evening. That's that's not really what marketing involves in many places anymore. It's it's there's a lot more kind of rational, analytical people who do it now. Um, I, I guess we could probably call that type of marketing performance marketing. That's another term for it. So the idea that you want to be able to measure the outcomes of what you're doing and attribute new sales or new registrations or whatever your goal is to the specific activities that you've done. So that's the first trend. And I think the second trend is the development of the venture capital industry, uh, the proliferation of startups and the fact that it's just sort of in the DNA of startups to try and achieve completely outrageously good results with very limited resources. And thanks to books like The Lean Startup or The Hard Thing About Hard Things or whatever other startup book you want to name, there's this sort of mythology that's built up around some of the techniques that Facebook and Airbnb and Uber used in the early days to acquire very large numbers of users. And I, I, I suppose the the legacy of that has been that marketing and digital product design and product management have come much closer together because if you want to quote unquote create viral loops um, you, you there has to be a sort of technology component to that it can't just be about the, the campaign that you're putting out there even if it is on digital channels and i mean it also manifests in a big shift towards marketing automation so towards software that can allow you to set up quite a complex set of campaigns that then run and optimize themselves according to triggers that are created by the data that comes back so, so that that's kind of um all of those things that sort of come together in the the phenomenon of, of growth marketing. Uh, but I guess it's, it, it's something that's also a bit of a crossroads because during the period in which that has become the fashionable part of marketing, I, I think there probably has been a bit of neglecting of creative and of brand and of some of the classical things that make marketing effective. An awful lot of startup brands and brands created by large companies to look like startups have the same sort of look and feel and experience attached to them. You know, you kind of make up a word that 
means nothing but where the domain name is available and it sounds sort of cheerful and then you, you pick a nice color palette and you have an infinite scrolling website and, and away you go and that, that's probably pointing towards an opportunity actually for people to rediscover some classical and um, creative and um, brand marketing and at the same time you've got this kind of the, the technology landscape is changing for a lot of the reasons that we've talked about, including the fact that Apple is trying to position itself as a champion of consumer privacy. So is constraining the ways in which targeting can happen to Apple users in ways that are going to make targeted marketing much harder, but they're also going to make the ability of marketers to measure their results a lot more difficult. So I guess if I had to make a, a prediction we're going to see a return to some of the traditional channels, which have looked like in, in recent years, like they were going forever. I think they're going to come back and people are going to rediscover that actually it is a good thing to run TV campaigns and to publish press ads in um, nice quality magazines. So yeah, well, let, let's let's hope that your your clients can um, well, yeah, we'll take that on board and not hire the growth hackers just as it's just as it's time for the end of growth hacking. What's your next uh, What's your next adventure? <laughs> so, so I have no idea what the answer to that question is. So, <laughs> the, you know, it's, so actually, the, the, like the truthful answer is, I, I was under the misapprehension that being an author is about writing things. But actually, it turns out that's not true at all. Like, that's only a, a, a tiny minority of the work. Like, the real work of an author is just relentless self-promotion. So th- this seems to be the immediate future. I, I'm not <laughs> sure how much I... How much, like, I'm really up for that. I prefer the introverted business of the writing. So I will have to see. You have to get back to research. <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. Get back to the library. <laughs> Thank you for, for joining us. I've, I've learned a lot. This is really insightful for me. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. Well, thank you both so much for having me. All right, folks, be sure to order a copy of Good Data today. And remember, until next time, the world is evolving. Are you? <laughs>